from Nashville, Tennessee. This is the day the Lord has made. Join us for the next 30 minutes as we share the gospel ministry of Dale and Jerry Robbins. Thank you for helping us to keep making these video presentations. Make your donation online at victorious.org forward slash donate. Once again, that's victorious.org forward slash donate. Thanks again for your faithfulness. 
May God richly bless you. I'm often asked if I really believe that we're living in the last days, which I absolutely do for a lot of reasons, but especially because today's society and world events line up precisely with what the scriptures predicted would be associated with such times. Aside from the many other prophetic signs of the end, such as those that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, is the forecast of a widespread outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we generally associate with spiritual renewal or revival, as well as the prediction of great wickedness, deception, and a falling away from the faith. There was a time I might have assumed that these contrary things would occur at separate times from the other, but one of the greatest revelations I've ever had was to realize that both will characterize the last days simultaneously, which is exactly what we see happening right now in the world and in our nation. Globally, the world has been experiencing a vast spiritual renewal for a considerable time, which has resulted in millions of conversions, especially from an astonishing source, from the, those of the Muslim faith. As shocking as it sounds, Iran has become home to the most rapidly growing underground body of Christians in the world, followed by other oppressed nations ruled by autocratic tyrants or parties. But this worldwide outpouring of God's Spirit has not halted oppression. In fact, missionary organizations such as Open Doors USA reports that Christian persecution is the highest ever in history. While we celebrate the surge of underground conversions in Muslim and communist nations, tens of thousands are suffering torture and death for their faith around the world. Back here in the United States, I've been praying for spiritual revival to come for many years. And, and we are seeing encouraging signs happening uh, these days. And most recently at the Asbury University in Kentucky, K Kentucky where um, several outbreaks of similar revival have occurred in past decades. But like elsewhere in the world, we are also seeing the simultaneous escalation of evil and perversion and an ominous rise in Christian persecution, even from our own government, which has in itself become ruled by radical leftists and neo-communists. To watch the rise of both good and evil has been confusing to many who have been praying for our nation, but if we really believe these are the very last days, as many of us do, then we can understand why there is such an intense spiritual conflict Christ is gathering his people for the rapture and the grand finale while Satan knows his time is short and is working over time to bring as much deception and ruin to the people of God as possible. This is the very thing that was predicted by Paul who warned God's people of the great falling away in the latter times. He said, now the Spirit speaks expressly saying that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. To be sure, Satan and his wicked spirits have worked their way into controversial teachings and doctrines to confuse and disillusion God's children through false teachers and teachings, which he forewarned would come. He said, for the time will come where they will, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. So how do we recognize false teachers, false prophets, and the such in this day and age? Well, first, there's a lot of people who claim to be prophets or teachers, but simply aren't. Some are well-meaning, trying to be used of the Lord, while others are deceitful, trying to lift themselves up or manipulate people. But when opening your heart to a teacher or preacher, you don't simply want someone who means well, but someone who is truly God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated, spirit-dependent, 
who uh, bear the marks of true authentic uh, authenticity with Christ in their lives. First, let's apply the Jesus test as it describes, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. He said, No one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. The most basic test is to first discern whether a, a teacher or preacher is really a follower of Christ. A true believer will always confess and proclaim Jesus as Lord. If he speaks against Christ or against his deity or his teachings, you know he's, he's a deceiver, whether he really means to be or not. John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. If someone denies that Jesus is the God-man, that is God come in the flesh, he's a false teacher or a false prophet. But John isn't saying that if, if they just get the incarnation right, that there's no other mistakes that they can make that are serious. That's not really his point. There's plenty of other matters they've got to get right too. He was just here just talking about that if the teacher acknowledges uh, Christ's deity in that he was every bit man and every bit God, he is at least on the right track so far. There's lots of clever false teachers who promote doctrines that deny the deity of Christ. That is, they teach that Jesus was just a good man, a good teacher, but not God. This, of course, is heresy, since Jesus stated himself in 1 John 14, 9, as well as other places, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Second test to determine whether a person is a true or false teacher or prophet is uh, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every, good, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There, therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. You've probably heard it said many times, you're not supposed to judge others, which is usually quoted out of context by those trying to justify something questionable they're involved with. But in reality, it's true, uh, while we're not to judge the hidden motives of a person's heart, which only God knows, but we certainly must examine and judge the fruit of those who purport to be spiritual leaders. Jesus made a very simple and obvious point here. The good trees don't produce corrupt fruit. A healthy apple tree doesn't bear rotten apples. If someone claims to be one of God's teachers, he will likewise be a person that produces godly moral character, not sinful immoral character. In other words, those who claim to have God's spirit should also bear the fruit of his spirit. Paul describes spiritual fruit like this. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, kindness, faithfulness, uh, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5, 22 and 24. In the previous three verses, before this, he contrasted these characteristics against a list of sinful behaviors that he described as the works of the flesh, which he described as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Obviously, 
this is not a complete list, but, but an example of many of the sinful works of the flesh. He says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Not only should a preacher, teacher's lifestyle not include any of these things or a prophet, but typical believers should not either. In fact, Paul said that this is the kind of lifestyle of those who will not go to heaven, unless, of course, they repent and turn to the Lord and away from such sin. Jesus not only made news with this explanation about fruit inspecting, but with another eye-opening declaration about signs and wonders. One would think, naturally, that uttering prophecies or casting out demons or Performing miraculous wonders would be surefire proof that a man or woman is of God, but not necessarily. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Are you shocked by that? Well, this is incredibly important to understand and to remember that signs and wonders never trump Christ-like moral behavior. To be sure, the demonstration of spiritual gifts bring powerful credibility to the message of the gospel, but they do not necessarily authenticate a true man or woman of God. I've seen miracles performed in association with preachers who were living in gross immorality and sin. So I know for a fact God can honor faith in His Word by the recipients, regardless of the impurities or the sins in uh, ministers, preachers, and vessels involved. Paul put a huge emphasis on the idea of holiness and righteousness in his own credibility to preach the gospel. He said, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5 and 6. He was talking about not only the power and demonstration of, of miracles, signs and wonders, but also in, in the way that he lived his life in a moral uh, and, and Christ-like way. If you have power from God to work wonders in you, you have the power of God to live a holy and consecrated life, right? Third, the third test is the sound doctrine test, as it says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. It's important to understand that genuine men or women of God are simply messengers of the Lord. Their doctrine and teachings are not their own and must be faithful to speak God's words. This being said, uh, Paul said to his young minister Timothy, he said, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Paul emphasized the same doctrinal importance, the doctrinal test, in 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 4. He said, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is, is, is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from come envy, strife, re, uh, revelry, uh, evil suspicions, 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 3 through 4. In other words, we need to measure the doctrines that are being taught by the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and by their implications for godliness. We need to be true to the Word of God. We need to be speaking what the Word of God says not our own uh, ideas. Number four, the fourth test that we need to apply is the truth test, which closely 
aligns with what we just referred to. The preacher, teacher, man or woman of God must be committed to truth and be correctable to the truth if or when necessary. In the New Testament times, ministers had to be submitted to, to the higher authority of the apostles who were their spiritual authorities and from what, where we get the New Testament epistles. We also must be submitted to those epistles as well as the Gospels of Jesus, as well as the Old Testament scriptures from which Jesus taught, which comprises our Bible. I heard somebody say some time ago, Jesus didn't preach from scripture. He did too. Look throughout the New Testament. He is constantly quoting from their Bible, the Old Testament, from which he based his teachings. Well, uh, ministers need the safety and accountability to these spiritual authorities of God's Word, as well as the trusted leaders, elders, uh, uh, apostles, who can help correct or hold them accountable when necessary. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, if you claim to be a prophet or think you're spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is command of the Lord himself, but if you do not recognize this, you yourself will not be recognized, 1 Corinthians 14, 37 through 38. That, that what that's saying is the authority of the apostles must be submitted to, or you're a false teacher. You're not recognized. John said it this way in 1 John 4. He said, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, 1 John 4, 6. Being accountable to the apostles, their epistles, that is the writings, uh, as well as the gospels, the word of God, is essential in our lives, uh, both to be disciples of the Lord as well as to be leaders and to disciple others. Accountability to truth and spiritual authority is especially important when it comes to prophetic utterances by those who claim to be prophets. I do believe in prophetic utterances, but I also um, realize that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of misguided people and those who try to manipulate others, as well as sincere but mistaken people who falsely prophesy in the Lord's name, going around saying, thus saith the Lord. Sometimes that's not really coming from the Lord. Unless what they uh, have to say really, really does come from God, it's a dangerous thing to be throwing around God's name this way. And he will hold so-called prophets accountable. In many cases, it would be safer to say things like, well, I, I feel like the Lord is saying or the Lord is leading, which personalizes the possibility that it might just be you who thinks this and it's not... Uh, absolutely coming from God. Because the Old Testament test of the prophet was very simple and harsh. If a prophetic prediction did not come to pass, the prophet was judged to be false, and the punishment would be that they would be put to death. Now, we don't put people to death in New Testament times or in the days in which we live, but I don't pay any more attention to a person who claims to be a prophet and prophesies falsely. And it's very easy uh, to determine whether a person is, is uh, saying the truth or not. Just wait and see what happens. Now, the Bible tells us, but uh, 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 how, do we, how do we determine whether a person is prophesying from the Lord? Well, it tells us in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21, the test. And uh, it, it warns us uh, not to speak falsely in the name of the Lord. And fifth and finally, the gospel test needs to be applied. There is a test of the gospel itself that Paul said that if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. So And so I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than you, what you have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9. The gospel in particular that uh, Paul was referring to was the gospel laid out in the book of Galatians, and it's the gospel of justification by faith alone apart from works of the law, which he summed up in uh, Galatians 5. He said in 
other words, if you insist on law keeping as a way of justification before God, you've got to keep it all. And you've got to keep it perfectly. And then he ends with a terrible warning for if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Galatians 5 and verse 4. So Paul was saying that the gospel in a nutshell is the salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or as it says in Ephesians uh, 2, 8, and 9, it, uh, for, uh, for by faith you're saved uh, and it's not of works lest any man should boast. And that is the nutshell of what uh, Paul was saying is the test of the gospel and if a person's not preaching that type of thing, they're preaching that you have to work your way to heaven or keep the law, they're out of sorts with the Word of God. Well, a lot of these things could be prevented in person's life, lives if they would simply get involved with a church and be a, be a part of a church where they can know the pastor, know uh, his lifestyle, know something about him, and, and be able to be a part of a community of believers. When we just watch TV church or internet church, you don't have that opportunity to know uh, the, the speaker, the preacher. There are many people uh, watch, watching us that have been a part of our churches over the years and they, they know me and know the character of my wife and I and something about uh, more of the details of what we believe and they, they trust us because of that. But typically you've got to be a part of, of, a, of a fellowship where you can know people and, and, and be connected which will help keep you from being steered astray into false doctrine or to falsehoods. Well, these are deceptive times in which we are living, as well as exciting times. And we see both things happening at the same time of falling away, as well as the potential of revival, and w which we pray and rejoice in God th that is beginning to happen. And we are trusting that God will continue in our nation around the world. Let's pray and ask God to, to help us, lead us, and to guide us today. Father in heaven, for my brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that, Lord, that you will uh, help them not to be discouraged with the, the evil that they see growing by leaps and grounds, but they will put their trust in you and rejoice in the renewal that we see also happening and to become a part of this good that you're doing here and elsewhere. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. We love you today with all our hearts and we hope to see you back here again next time. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. For more information, please visit our website at victorious.org. Until next time, God bless you.